As fitness enthusiasts, we love to hear human interest stories where exercise and community have played a vital role in the transforming of people's lives. Behind any documentary are hours and hours of footage left behind on the editing room floor. Oftentimes, as viewers of these remarkable stories, we are left wanting more. We've created Beyond the Journal to dig a little deeper. Hear how their 15 minutes of fame has impacted their journey. We'll see where they are now and what's next. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and click the icon to receive notifications so you never miss an episode. We're also available on all traditional podcast platforms. I'm Scott Schweitzer. And I'm Kat Shear. And, and we're, we're taking, taking you Beyond, beyond the, the Journal. journal. Welcome to episode one of a new podcast called Beyond the Journal. Kat and I have always been fascinated by all these human interest stories that come out on the CrossFit Journal, but we know that there's a lot of information that doesn't make it to that final edit uh, of that documentary. So we want to clear that up and, and get the more complete story with people that, that actually went through that. Yeah, so our first guest, we've got Justin Garrett. Um, Justin, you were the subject of a documentary that posted in the CrossFit Journal on um, December 19th, 2018. It was called The Day Fat Justin Died. Um, and for folks that haven't seen it, um, you should go watch it. Uh, we'll put the link down below. But the quick cliff note version, you grew up overweight, you drank too much, you got into a car crash. That sort of was the impetus for you to turn your life around. You met a doctor, you found CrossFit and sort of the rest is history, right? Yep. How you doing? That's, it. That's the 30,000 foot level overview. Exactly. Nailed it. Yeah, I'm doing <laughs> great. Thank you, Kat, for the, the intro. So now we're going to go into more detail of that story and kind of get the, the behind the scenes of everything that went on through that. And so I, in the documentary, you talk a lot about growing up as an overweight kid and how there was a lot of peer abuse with that. Right. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's hard to fit in when you're, uh, you know, uh, you've got an extra 50 to 100 pounds on the, the kids that you're going to school with. Did, did that peer abuse ever turn into bullying at all? Um, there was a few times where I would say, yes, there was some, you know, pretty harsh words and, and uh, never anything physical. Um, but definitely there was verbal abuse that, uh, that took a toll. And, there was, and I think I had mentioned it in the documentary, but there's plenty of times where my, I, you know, I'd walk, I'd make the trip out from the front door of the school and, and uh, hit my mom's minivan and then just kind of the floodgates would open up, you know, and, and, and the emotions would flow because it was a, it was a tough day, you know, so I can, I can recall, recall more than one occasion where, where that was the case. And you, you mentioned in the documentary that your parents were very protective um, and would give you a lot of encouragement that it, it's okay to be you and, and a lot of that stuff and, and just trying to make you feel better. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't have been closer to my parents and especially I grew up an only child. And so I never really had like a, a, a consoling older sibling or younger sibling to, to usher those feelings. And um, so my parents were instrumental and in, in still, you know, saying that, you know, think about the positives, think about how smart you are, think about how good of grades you get and, and you're doing great things and you're still a great person. And, and those kids are just insecure and, and um, you know, they did their best to, to comfort me when those those times came. And you also state that, that during that time that made you a little more sensitive to things. Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, and it's still, I still am a very sensitive person. So yeah, I think that kind of built my foundation for that sensitivity was that it kind of heightened my emotional awareness and intelligence. Uh, did that make it, did that make like just doing anything more? You were, you had a sensitivity going into that, that if anything was going to be, uh, head in a bad direction, you were already, your mindset was like, it's going to happen that way anyway. Right. Yeah. I definitely had this kind of heightened level of awareness when I was in pretty much any situation where I was like, I feel like because of previous comments and the way that, that people have interacted with me that like I was the focal point when I entered a room. And so like, hey, like we're going to be, we're going to be delicate and we're going to walk on pins and needles here and, and, you know, kind of stay in your lane and do your best to to fly as much under the radar as you can, even though you're, I felt like I was a spectacle. So uh, yeah, it was difficult. 
So can you walk us through kind of your weight gain trend from being a child up through high school? Like how quickly did it come on? Was there, was there a pivotal moment where it really came on? Right. Yeah. Um, I think it was, it was pretty gradual, right? Like I, like I said in the documentary, I grew up in a Midwest house. Comfort food was a big thing. It was also the nineties. And so, you know, the nineties was, there was not a huge uh, focus on health and wellness. And um, that was the fat free era, right? Like that, that was the thing where people thought fat was horrible. So everything had fat free on the label. And um, you know, my parents were both employed. They both worked 40 hour weeks. They, they made the things that were, accommodating to their schedule and it was you know that was just kind of the thing and so it was never like an, an intentional lack of focus it was just kind of the time period and the era that it was um and then i really started to notice it when i got out of elementary school i mean i was just a little husky i would say in elementary school but then getting to junior high where kids become a little more aware and um just their their level of uh, intelligence and stuff grows and, and so they would make more comments and they would kind of get a little digger, dig a little deeper. Um, but I really noticed it when like I started participating in group activities, like doing band or doing like I was playing on the football team. They would get like the T-shirts for those teams. And it was the old, you know, Cotton Haynes T-shirt. And they're, they don't carry an inventory of 2X in junior high school. And so I'm a seventh grader and they're like, what size shirt do you want? I'm like, well, I need a 2XL. That extra large isn't going to fit me. And that was kind of, and, and it was like a special request. Like they had to like pull strings to get me a shirt. And that was really kind of the first time I was like, oh, wow, okay, this, this sucks. And, um, and then also like, you know, you shop at a big and tall store and there's a limited supply and e-commerce wasn't that big back then. And so like I had about four, four or five shirts that I wore on a steady rotation. And so kids would notice that and then they would, they would tease me. So that was that was when I kind of started becoming socially aware that I was getting bigger and I was in a, on, on a bad trend. Um, so that was when I kind of, I, I started doing like track and football as just a means of trying to be active. I had no aspirations of being good at either of them. It was just kind of a last ditch Hail Mary effort of like, maybe I can try and counteract what's the trend that I've been going on, you know? Um, and so I, I was always active and, and I tried to do that, but, the phrase never struck then like it does now of like you can't outrun a bad diet and um and i tried and but i was still eating bad stuff and so um yeah then i got to high school and and it continued i just it was just kind of a gradual linear progression you know it was never like 40 pounds in a year it was just like 12 years of gaining you know 10 pounds every year and it just kind of added up um and yeah, I made an effort in high school and I, I switched my diet up and, and I was eating salads instead of pizza at lunch and exercising and playing basketball and took on another PE class and I lost like 30 pounds. Um, but then towards the end of that senior year, the, the social pressure of like drinking and, um, you know, doing, going to the party things and trying to fit in and being big guy, like I wanted to fit in wherever I could and however I could. And so um, that kind of started my and entryway into you know social drinking um and so with that that just kind of escalated throughout college so let's just backpedal a little bit yeah sorry so I were, talked about no that's great 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 it's good information so you said you were socially aware did you become what was there an, a, an area of concern like for health reasons at, at some point during that that slow build up that mountain of of weight gain yeah, totally. There was, there was a couple of points and, um, I have told this story before, but there was, uh, I was probably, I was in for, I, I would avoid the doctor at all costs because the scale was like the first thing he did when you got in there and I hated it and it, and it always shamed me. And, and I remember going in for a physical for the school year. That was generally my, if I could, my only time to go to the doctor. And, uh, and I would always have this level of anxiety because I would step on the scale and I had this physician, just a GP that, um, that I was seeing at the time. And, and he had, he sat me down after going to the scale and getting in the room and my parent, my mom was in there and, and, uh, and he was like, are, are you tying this guy to a chair and feeding him Snickers bars? Like what's going on here? And, um, and so there was, there was that moment for sure where, uh, you know, I 
felt that from a medical standpoint where I was getting some pretty bad, like social stigma from a doctor and that. And so I think that started a point where like a few years later, as it kind of got worse that my parents made an effort to get me into like a childhood. It was, I don't remember the exact context of it, but I felt like it was kind of like a childhood obesity, like activity thing. That was the combination of diet and exercise. Um, but I felt a level of shame going to that. I kind of felt like I was being sent to fat camp. Um, and so it was, I lost steam on that pretty quickly. Um, but there was definitely just points in time where I tried to make an effort and my parents tried to guide me down that path. And um, I, it just, I was never committed to it and it, it made it really difficult. Um, yeah. Justin, yeah. what did, what would a normal day of eating look like say in high school for you? Yeah, I was definitely not like a breakfast person. So it was never like I started my day off eating badly, but it was one of those where you go to school and it's the, it's basically like you're eating out of a gas station, right? Like you've got Papa John's pizza or you've got the school lunch. The schools weren't, again, it was like the early 2000s. So the schools weren't making like a huge focal point on nutrition. So, I mean, I'd probably eat like two pieces of Papa John's pizza and then grab one of the, like a random little Debbie or hostess dessert and have that for lunch, like five days a week. It was, it was pretty bad. And then, you know, go home. And again, it was, my parents are working 40 hours a week and, and I, you know, wasn't into cooking by any means in high school, not many high schoolers are. Um, and so I would just eat, you know, we were uh, a meat and potatoes kind of family, but there was always, you know, starchy carbs and stuff like that. And, and I loved salads, but I would put a gallon of ranch dressing on it. And so it was like, uh, these like little things I would do good, but I was counteracting them by, you know, putting stuff on top of them. So, I mean, I would say like conservatively, I was probably eating like 3000 calories a day and, you know, throw some, throw some soda in there too, a can of pop every day. And so there was, yeah, that was, or chocolate milk at school. So it was, I was drinking and eating my calories, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Justin, you, um, you say you cope with, with humor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also mentioned just a minute ago that you turned to drinking a little bit and that the two of those kind of work together to try to help you fit in. For sure. Absolutely. I was, I would say uh, I was affectionately in college known as just kind of the fat, funny, drunk guy like uh, that. And, um, and yeah, so I would, like you said, I would cope with humor. I would try and be as funny as possible. I would, um, you know, kind of get, there was nothing I wouldn't do while I was drinking and to a level of humor when you're 19 to 18 to 21, you know, like they just like any, get in where you fit in. And so I would, you know, I would party and, and I would feel some sort of kind of false level of confidence that uh, while I was drinking that, that made me feel like I was kind of a normal person because everyone else was doing it and, and I could fit in. So. And, and what kind of drove you to that is that you, you say that you always felt different. Like when you walked in a room, it was like the music stopped, everybody was staring at you and this was your way to like overcome that. Right. Totally. Absolutely. Be, be loud, be obnoxious. Like it's kind of like the same thing I'm saying, like make self deprecate yourself before someone else can do it. Right. Like that was kind of my thing was like, uh, like make us make a scene so that do something funny right quick. So that, uh, you know, it kind of like, just yeah, removes that from the room right away, you know? Yeah, it's almost like you knew the focus was gonna be on you anyway, so let's shift it to something that's maybe a little more fun, right? Yes, exactly. Like you're being funny and, and all that as opposed to just your appearance. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's stated in the documentary, and this, this is gonna be hard for a lot of people to believe, but that an, a night out for you could be up to 30 beers or, yeah. <laughs> or two liters of whiskey. Yes. Yep. I mean, a combination of doing it often and my size alone, it was, that's what I, I could handle that capacity. And, uh, and I actually had that conversation with someone the other day and they were, they just couldn't fathom that from really a human level that someone was able to do that. But, um, yeah, I mean, and now looking back at how unhealthy and detrimental that was, I, I would give anything to be able to undo that. And yeah, yeah. this version of myself can't fathom that at all right yeah. it, it's weird because i i used to be 500 plus pounds um and i have my own story and and i know that that is possible right i've right. been there and i've and i've been in your shoes and i've done those things 
Um, so I know it's possible. And that's why your story really spoke out to me because I, I've been through a lot of the phases that you went through. Mm -hmm. And so how often were you drinking? Not only were you drinking mass amounts a night, but what, did that leak into to more than just a weekend? For sure. Yeah. And especially in college and actually it led into my like once that post-college like professional life too, where um, I would say I was good for three to four days a week in college um, at times. And it definitely hampered my first year of my education. And, you know, I was on academic probation. I had no balance because I was off on my own. And, and so that definitely had an uptick. And that was probably the worst year for my diet too, because I'm drinking late and then I'm eating late and college towns, you can get food at two in the morning, which is crazy. And um, yeah, I would say even, you know, like the Thursday night kind of start the weekend early once I got out of school. So I would say anywhere from three to four nights a week was pretty consistent for a good portion of my like early twenties. Yeah. And I, and I had a follow up that you kind of touched on is what, what was that relationship with the heavy drinking and your food intake? It's, in, it's impossible to manage when you, when you lower your inhibitions, right? Like you're already, I already at, you know, 300 plus pounds, you've got a big appetite, right? You got to fuel that machine and then you throw in the, the drinking on top of it. And it's like, well, I'm not going to do anything that's, I'm not going to cook or prepare anything that's going to be nutritious because that takes effort. So it's what can I throw in the oven? Who can I call and get delivery from or something like that? So it was, it was never healthy food and it was always high quantity. I would, you know, it wouldn't just be one of something. It would be like two Chipotle burritos or two pita pit pitas or, you know, a whole Totino's pizza. It was, there was never scale and, and there was never quality. So it was, it definitely kind of, cross pollinated each other in a really bad way. It's, it's funny you say that cause I still buy in twos. <laughs> Just thank goodness. Now, like I buy two cantaloupes or I buy two watermelons <laughs> or, but I'm still yeah. buying in twos. And it, it, that's funny that you say that. Cause I, I actually did do the same thing. Right. Totally. Yeah. And so did, did the drinking ever turn to where you would even do it while you were by yourself? Yeah, there was a, there, not, not frequently, but I definitely am guilty of having done that in the past where I would, you know, I'd be by myself and I'd be waiting for my friends to, to join me. And I'd I'm like, I have got nothing better to do. I'm going to get a three hour head start on these guys while they're, while I'm waiting on them. And then I would be blotto by the time that they would find me. And, and then it was just stupid. You know, it was yeah. pretty shameful. Well, and, I, and I think that's funny. It's a, because you started this so that you would be the funny guy right? And, and be more relaxed. And then it turns into a point where you're doing it by yourself where there's nobody to be funny to, mm -hmm. you know, it just becomes part of your habit. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Sadly. It's true. So, yeah. so we want to talk about the friends in the documentary. There's, there's a picture with you with tons of friends all the time and you're, you're in party atmospheres. Mm -hmm. Were those relationships tight? Do you still have those relationships or were they more superficial? A combination of both. Um, there was the people who I've known for 20 years, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, and, um, and those people have been by my side. They've been the ones with their hands on my back, pushing me up the hill. Right. And, and the constant feedback and the constant encouragement and the support. And, and when I started being healthy and, and like being less fun, I'll say in air quotes, you know, um, they they didn't care and and they they saw the benefits and they saw my progress and they were like we are behind you a hundred percent and those relationships if anything have gotten stronger um which i love and i cherish but my circle has certainly gotten smaller um and i'll attribute uh, part of it was because of my shift in lifestyle and then part of it moving of course to the other side of the country but um, I could tell when I when I started drinking a lot less before I m moved from Kansas to Seattle that um, the people want you for different things, right? And and like if hey if we're not going out on Friday night, I'm not I don't really have any use for you. Right? And so there was definitely that that circle went and contracted down, and um, it was it was pretty telling when that when that happened. It was like okay, this is what our friendship was based on was around going to the bars, and that's that's not really even a relationship. That's just, you're more acquaintances that do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But the circle's so, small, good, so. 
So you mentioned that your drinking sort of bled into your post college career, you were getting a job and all of that. Um, you also mentioned in the doc that there were times that you would say to yourself, like things would happen and you would say, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. But, but it still took something else for you to sort of make that change. Can you give us some insight into some of the things that would make you say that? Oh man, I think a lot of it was fueled by rejection, right? Um, or just a comment that would trigger me. And a lot of times I would have those kind of, I don't want to say like meltdown moment, but like kind of a tipping point. There was, there were several of them. And I can remember even though a lot of them were fueled by alcohol, right? And you're these, all these emotions that you build up and you pent up and you keep so deep inside that you would probably never externalize if you weren't drinking um, is when those would happen. Right. And so I would be with my friends. I would be drunk. I, I would be in my, you know, college age or post college age and something would happen that would kind of offset me and trigger me a little bit that, that I was probably already upset about before um, that kind of just like hit the pressure valve and they couldn't hold anymore. And so I would have these conversations where someone would say something like I'd walk by, someone would say something inappropriate about my weight and I would lose it. And my friends would calm me down and pull me to the side, but then I would be like bawling my eyes out and be like, I just can't, take this life anymore and I don't like like not in a like I'm gonna end my life but like I don't like this lifestyle this path that I'm on I hate it I want to change and I'll do something but then I'd sober up and I kind of lost my my momentum from that feeling right um, mm -hmm. so a lot of times it was either like a girl that I had a crush on who was had completely friend zoned me and but I thought I had a chance and then I would find out that she wasn't at all interested in me or she would, you know, whatever. And so like those kind of things, people being mean to me, saying things um, would kind of put me in a little like very brief spiral where I would, you know, be upset and very emotional. Okay. So it sounds like that was, that was more in a react of a reaction to sort of how your physical body was and not the drinking necessarily. Right. Is that, yeah. is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and like anything, like just like the eating, like the emotions, like drinking just made it worse. And so like any sensitivity I was feeling like was heightened by the alcohol. So I would eat more when I was drinking, I would feel more when I was drinking. And so there was always this kind of just ebb and flow of emotions that was pretty drastic at times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So take us back to the day of the accident. Um, mm -hmm. You're how old? I am 32 right now. No, I'm sorry. How old were you? <laughs> <laughs> we're doubling back from there. No, I was 24 at the time. 24. Okay. And the accident happened during the day, correct? During it the day? It was like, uh, late afternoon, evening. Yeah, like 6, 37-ish. And you were, you were already legally drunk at the time of that accident, correct? Well before that, yeah. Well so before I, that. What was going on that day? Yeah, I had, that was my first job out of college. And, um, and I had a group of friends that I, that had helped get me that job. And we were the happy hour crew and we had an expense account and we would go do happy hours together. And this was like a, that afternoon was a company, like a company wide, not like our small group, um, happy hour events, kind of team builder thing at a, at a bar, like three miles from the office. And, um, my happy hour group was like, Hey, let's go pregame for this before we go over there. Kind of kick, kick the edge because the, we're going with all the other stiffs. And, um, so we, we went to a bar and I probably had, I mean, again, we're going back to what Scott was saying, right. About the context of how much you can drink at a, at a big weight. Right. And so, um, you know, I probably had four or five like double vodka Red Bulls and then drove from there. I was already very drunk when I left the first bar to go to this company event. And so um, it was, and I came in there and I was sloppy and I was, it was, if you talk about like how people have like rock bottom as kind of their impetus for change, like all of my rock bottoms were like in a three hour span of just like, this was a bad day. Like it, this was where you could really see it was evident that I was heading in a very bad direction. And so I showed up there and was, just chumming it up with the, the executives from my company and, and like, you know, smacking them on the back and I'm, I'm drunk and, you know, being a, a level of myself that I would never have been otherwise. Um, and then I 
my really my last memory was right before the accident was that I was in the parking garage leaving that restaurant to go home and I was going pee next to my car in the parking garage um, just out in the open and um, and then the next thing I can remember is like being on the the flat board getting put into the ambulance after my car accident and not knowing what's going on and so um, yeah it was just like that. And you luckily you were it was a single car crash, correct? Yeah. And and just uh, you. Yeah, and what the the documentary wasn't able to portray there's what Torrent had put some video clips in there that were kind of they look like what you would have seen like the helicopter watching OJ do the high speed pursuit like there was a the footage that was in there of that car accident was my car accident. Um I was able to get it from the the nearest like surveillance camera um on the freeway that that i where i crashed and um so yeah it was it was just myself and i veered across i mean we're talking 6 30 7 o'clock at night it's not like traffic super light and by some miracle i went across basically like five lanes two shoulders three lanes um and crashed into the median without a single person being hurt besides myself mm. That's a blessing. So, so t talk us through um, sort of the doctor that you meet and how soon after all this happens, do you, do you sort of turn around? Yeah. So I believe that happened on a Wednesday. And uh, so that, that night or the next morning I had surgery on one of my ankles um, cause it was a compound fracture and they had to straighten that back up and put a, a pin in there. Um, to stabilize it. And so the doctor that had performed that surgery was, uh, was Daniel Farrell, the guy who, who I would meet like the next day when I was more coherent. Cause I mean, they're like operating on me and I'm still very much kind of incapacitated. And so I met him about two days later and, and to kind of go through the, the post-op um, and him telling me what he had done to my foot. Um, and, uh, and then I came out of the bed and stepped down and we found out that my other foot was broken. So I, I they thought they thought I was gonna be able to be on crutches, you know, one foot functional, the other foot with the compound, and then that's when we find out that the second foot is is broken. Um, and so that was that was the day that that it changed, right? That was kind of my day where he intervened in a good way and said, Hey, this is this is where we're at. He goes, you, you, you've got this scale on your bed and it's, and it's saying 405 and we now know that we're going to have to put a screw in your right foot too and you're going to be completely immobilized um, for six weeks. And so, uh, you know, this is, you're, you are at your fork in the road today and here's a chance to make a change and do something positive while you've got an opportunity to completely control your diet. Um, and, and that's the only thing that's in your control. And so... Um, yeah, he had practiced the, uh, the paleo diet and had had success with it. And so he had him saying that he had had results and had a positive impact. It, it, it struck a chord with me. And, and I think I was very scared because there was so much uncertainty in my life right then that, uh, I bought in. And so, and so how long afterwards did you, um, start CrossFit? Oh, wow. Um, I did, I dieted alone. That was it. Um, with, I would say the only exercise I did in the first year being golf. Um, uh, I started CrossFit in my accident was June 6th of 2012. And I started CrossFit July 22nd of 2013. So okay. just like later, uh, basically. And did the weight just, had you lost a bunch of weight prior to starting CrossFit? I imagine with the nutrition that you were following. Yeah. Yeah. I lost. So my goal after seeing that I was successful, I lost about 40 pounds, I think in that six weeks, it was pretty wild because I had just drastically changed my diet and it just like melted off. And it was really hard to tell because I was in a wheelchair. So, you know, you sit down, everything kind of compresses and it's hard to tell. But then once I was able to get up and be on crutches, like, I was like Oh my God, like my shirt looks like a nightgown on me. And like when I started getting results, I was addicted. I was like, this is it. Like we've, we found it. And, uh, and so I, when I went back to work, um, somehow that company didn't fire me, but, um, <laughs> yeah, um, the president of the company came up and he saw that I was losing weight and he was like, do you have any goals 
right and, uh, around this because you're you're successful now at doing it and uh i said yeah i want to lose 100 pounds in a calendar year from from my accident and um he's like okay well i'll i'll give you a trip to wherever you want to go for two people if you uh if you hit your goal like that's it no no strings attached let's do it and so um that kind of put some wind in my sails along with the results and i was like all right let's do this and so i just stuck to that diet like it was gospel and um come july 1st of 2013 i was down 100 pounds on the nose and uh and so i hit my goal and and he got that and i was living with a guy at the time and and uh, he had just started crossfit this was july he had just started crossfit like three months earlier and um had been telling me about it every weekend like man you got to come on monday you got to come join this gym this crossfit Olathe, you got to see what it's about and these people are awesome and they're they would love you and and your sense of humor and, and all this and um and they really support you and i was like all right i'll do it and then, but i would never end up showing up and then finally mm -hmm. one time i was like so sick of him hammering on me for all these months and i'm like okay enough i will show up i will i will do this if it'll get you to stop talking to me about it <laughs> and so like a lot of people's journey into crossfit right and yep. um and so I showed up and, and that was it. It's just like the diet. Like it took one, one positive experience, which was the first day and, uh, and I was in. So just to, to backpedal a little bit to the diet. So I know in the documentary, the, the, the doctor said nuts, seeds, fruit, vegetables. Did he give you a plan or was it just that? And you were like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, so he told me about the Primal Blueprint, which is a Mark Sisson book and diet that he had got. So it's like that caveman diet, right? Um, and uh, there was a methodology to it and, and a guidance around what you should and should not eat. And, um, and so he told me, and my parents were there with me when he was talking about it. And like my mom heard that, she ordered the book and the cookbook like that instant and had it shipped. And then she read that thing cover to cover in like a few days and there's i mean i still have the book i still have it with all the color-coded post-it notes and the highlights and you could tell like how into it she was for me because she knew that i had a chance and she was gonna you know she was in with me right and um and so like she took that she started preparing my food because i couldn't walk i was in a wheelchair so she's like I'm, I'm going to the grocery store the day I'm leaving the hospital. I was in the hospital for seven days. And so like that day before, like she's, she went to the grocery store, got all the foods, everything that we needed. And they were like, we're doing it with you. Like we're going to jump in and, and it's going to be a family thing. And I had to move back in with them to, to have their support. And, uh, and so it was just, a, it was a team effort. And we did the, the primal blueprint together and followed that, like, like I said, religiously. And so it was very much that meat, vegetables, fruit, and nuts and it was and i really i ate when i was hungry I, there was no bounds there's no calorie counting it was like hey if you're eating positive things and you're hungry eat it and so i think that's uh where people get in the weeds about restricting their food it's like hey if you if you're hungry you can eat just eat the right things yeah, yeah. did your parents notice a difference did they were they overweight at all did they lose weight did they get healthier yeah they yeah we were all overweight them definitely not to the scale that i was um but they saw the same, same thing, right? Like we all changed our diet together. And I think that they probably each were down 20 or 30 pounds, like within the first like six months. So they, they saw the same impact. Their diet wasn't as bad as mine, right? They weren't drinking so many calories like I was. Um, so like the impact of a hard pivot for them was not as tremendous as it was for me. But, yeah, uh, I think it's really important too, when people are trying to change their habits. Um, I, I know I'm a nutrition coach. So even just with someone trying to lose five ten pounds, 10 pounds, having people around you, like your environment, you know, really can help make or break your success at times. I know I live with teenagers and they eat like crap. <laughs> it makes it really hard, you know, for right. me to eat that way. And I like it when they go on little trips and vacations, cause I can sort of focus a little bit more on myself. So that's great that you had that support system. Absolutely. I think I would, I don't think without their support, that we'd be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. so. Very it, cool. It's funny. It's another parallel that we have because my mom, when I lost my weight, lost 125 pounds. Amazing. 
you know, and when you, when you have supportive parents like that, that are, that are buying in, you know, my wife jumped into, she lost 95 pounds, like the, you know, the whole family just did the same thing and uh, it just turned out great. So the one thing that another parallel we have is when you, when you lose a lot of weight, uh, you have, you have issues with skin that doesn't stretch back. Right. And so that, that, that plays a major role in this documentary and kind of what you went through with all of the skin. Yeah, absolutely. How painful it looked. I'd never had that surgery done. Um, and I, and I use like, I kept under armor in business trying to keep my skin like when I work out and stuff. Right. Um, and I know that you said you tucked in like tank tops to get it to be the same way you got the surgery. How, how, what was that like? Scary as hell to start off with. I will not lie. I was, I, the, the morning it was, it was crazy. Cause the morning I think it was destiny that I, I, I should do it. Cause I think the day that, I like right before I went in to go in for surgery at the surgery center, I think I had gotten something posted by like the CrossFit Instagram page and like had like 13,000 likes and like there was hundreds of comments of positivity and stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. Again, I've got support here. And like this, it was just kind of a sign for me to do it. And, and my wife now, my now wife girlfriend at the time had given me a ton of support and she had more courage for me than I had for myself, but it was, like the first few days was really rough, but it, it really leveled out. And I, um, you know, you're given, you're given medication. I tried to minimize that as much as I could just for fear of the general things, right. Of, of, of narcotics and stuff like that. But it was excruciating for a few days, but it, it leveled out honestly. Um, and I think knowing what I, my final state could be kind of outweighed the short term pain um of that and i can unequivocally say that i would do it 100 times over again i would uh, 100 out of 100 times i would choose to do it it was um it was a good decision for me yeah i i know it's one of the most frustrating things for me uh to this day it still gets in the way i'm trying to do barbell work sometimes and um but yeah yeah no oh, it and yeah, the, the the risk and the reward outweighed the thought of not doing it for me because I I just in my mind I had worked so hard for for two and a half three years um, to get down to that kind of homeostasis weight that I was at and had you know I was still in love with exercising and doing all that but I still like as secure as I was with myself I was also insecure about something new right it's you just pivot from being insecure about being overweight. So now, Oh, I've got this loose skin and like certain ways that I would hold myself, it wouldn't show in other ways that I would. And so it was just something that I, I thought I needed to do. And, and the end result, I'm just beyond pleased with, but, but I understand a lot of people have the same hesitations, reservations, and kind of the recovery time that comes along with it. Yeah. yeah. So Justin, talk to me a little bit about um, when the documentary was filmed and, and when it came out. What did, what did that day look like for you when it was released and how was it released? So it came through the, the main site daily email that I can recall at the time. I think that was, I was kind of, Torrin had sent me a note and was like, hey, this video is coming out soon. Like be on the lookout for it. And so I was kind of like every day I'm like waiting for my, my main site email to see when it's the link's going to be in there and like the, the thumbnail for it. And, um, Oh man, it was so emotional. Um, wow. Yeah, it was powerful. Um, it was super cool. And it, it was just like, I've had so much support along the way that it was just another day of like seeing the good in the world and that having people reach out like instantly for advice or support, it was cool. It was just an awesome experience. Um, mm -hmm. cool. And where were you in your journey? Had you, had you started coaching at this point in time when it was released? Were you still just an athlete? What, where were you? Yeah, I had been coaching for about a year. So it was, um, I, yeah, I had been 
about six or seven months removed from my first skin removal surgery. Um, so I was coaching, I was feeling really good about myself and um, it was kind of a, just like another, like where these like peaks and valleys of things in this journey have ebbed and flowed, right? And, and that kind of created another uh, peak where, you know, people are, are reaching out and um, yeah, it, it also like really, caused a great level of like energy in my gym to um, where I was at the time. Like uh, just people were like, Oh my God, like the, the, even the smallest change that they wanted to make, if it was like losing 10 pounds, like it created this like thought in their mind, like oh, I can do it like, or whatever it was, maybe it was something physical, like something that they didn't think they could do, but it, it created conversation and, and stirred a community. Um, so it was really cool to see the kind of the impact that it had on the people around me too. Love it. So what does, what does a day in your life look like today in comparison to what it did 10 years ago? I pop out of bed, which uh, I was borderline narcoleptic back then. I couldn't get good sleep. Um, so, uh, you know, waking up early is not, I'm not huge on it, but uh, I'm a morning person. I like to get going. I uh, wake up, I slug 30 ounces of water right when I get out of bed. I never used to drink water, so hydration's huge now. Um, you know, I do intermittent fasting now for the most part, so I, you know, I don't really focus on food throughout the, the first half of my day. Um, I mean, one of the biggest changes is I just opened a gym, so I'm, I'm coming in here and, and we're in my, my first week of being open, so um, it's been hectic, but uh, you know, I eat a, super healthy, well-balanced lunch. I eat carbs now when I didn't eat carbs for the first six years of my, my journey here um, and weight loss. And so, you know, still doing a lot of those same things that I did when I started dieting. I've, I eat a lot of meat and vegetables, a little bit of fruit um, and just good healthy carbs and stuff like that. And then um, I've fallen in with a group of people that I love to, to exercise with. And we usually do about 90 minutes of, of, um, of training a day and then uh, go home and eat a big meal and, and hang out with my wife. And so it couldn't be more of a, a 180 degree diversion from where it was in the past. And uh, yeah, so it's great. So, so let me take a guess. The name of your gym is Invictus Seattle. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> it intuitively guess there. So I'm in my work, my work uniform right now, so. Yeah. Did, um, how did you get hooked up with the folks at Invictus? Great question. Um, so I've been training with one of my best friends, Kevin Kester, for the last two years or so. Um, we kind of collided together in our, in our last community, um, kind of seeing one another in passing. He would do his, his competitive training at the same time that I was attending normal classes. And, um, and I was super impressed by him because I knew he was an older guy, but he was absolutely jacked and the nicest dude to everyone that he saw. And he knew that I had a story. And one day we went and we, sorry, this is a long winded answer for how we got here, but um, no, please. we went on a, a mile and a half warm up run um, together. And I told him my story that day. And, uh, and he was just blown away by it. And I got to hear about him and about his background and how he found fitness and CrossFit and couldn't have a different background than one another. He's I've been athletic and healthy his whole life. Um, and that was kind of the first day that our friendship started and we started working out together and he was following Invictus um, Masters programming online at our gym and, um, and had a lot of success with that. And so he won his age group at the games twice and the second time that he went was last year and I trained as his coach and trained with him um, and so when we got back from Madison we were kind of kicking around like man it'd be pretty cool to kind of have our own gym and and do our own thing and, and reach a, a bigger audience and um, with our two stories being so different but touching such a large demographic um, we thought that we could have a profound impact on our community and so um, when we started making a little more serious thought to it. I said, you know, you, you have this relationship with CJ down in San Diego. as one of their athletes. Like what if we went big on this and, and tried to, to see if they'd be willing to partner with us and, and let us use their name up here. Um, 
And so he reached out and then CJ came up and met with us and kind of heard our vision and my background and, and he was, he was in. And so he really liked what, what we wanted to do thinking about making this community gym where we could touch people of every age, race, size, gender, just making this inclusive place that has a focus on, on wellness and making people healthy and, um, yeah, the rest is history. We we struck up a partnership and and uh, we've been kind of going through the motions for for, um, for the last nine months. So that's, that's great. So that's I have to, I have to ask: is um, is he going to the Masters Fitness Collective by any chance? Is, is he going to compete in that? Indiana? Yes. <sighs> he is not. He with opening the gym, we have not had time to if kevin is in kevin is in and uh i haven't had enough time to get him where he wants i think he could go and do great as he is right now but uh for him he's got to feel comfortable so well boo scott I, and i are going to be judging that in a couple weeks so maybe we thought maybe we could bump into him oh no yeah. <laughs> well, i'm so excited to see that event play out though and i know that invictus is helping with the programming i think and um, yeah cj did all of it yeah, and and they were they were just here. They actually left a few days ago. I think he's on his road trip to get there. Um, Probably right, family and uh, and he was over the moon to be a part of it and and get that going with you guys. Very cool. So do you do you face any struggles today? You know, you're you're into this journey. What eight years now? Um, yeah, eight years. Do, do, do you face struggles? In, during the day or are you pretty much moved on from that? I sometimes still eat like my old self. And as far as like a quantity goes, like there's, I told my wife, I joked with her semi-seriously at the new year. Uh, I'm not a huge new year's resolution guy, but I was like, maybe I should work on my portion control a little bit this year. Um, and it's easy to justify eating a lot if you work out a lot, um, which I think plenty of people go through that exact thing, right? of kind of rationalizing their eating based on their training, regardless of what size you are. And, um, and so I would say that is definitely one thing where I'm like, okay, like let's, let's pump the brakes. Let's cool it a little bit. Like, um, I found my, my flatline weight where I'm like comfortable being right now. Um, but yeah, I definitely go through moments where I'm like, I feel a little insecure or something like that. And I think it's just human nature, but, uh, for the most part, I've, I've ingrained it so much into my life and, seen the results and the positives and the benefits that it's it's here to stay for me um i don't have a, an immense fear of any sort of regression really at this point in time which um, i feel blessed to feel that way that's good i i have one final question so um in the documentary the narrator talks about um the most profound change in you was the change in your body Right. And he was referring to the skin surgery. It, you reflecting back now, sort of having all of this in your rear view mirror. If I were to ask you that same question now, what would, what would you say is the most profound change? Would it be your body or would it be something else? No, I would say it's my, my mindset um, for just for everything, um, for my capacity for hard work, not in the gym, but um, for being able to pay attention to what my my surroundings are my awareness to things my capacity for empathy and um i would say the emotional side of it it just like everything for me is very heightened in a good way now um and i would say yeah that the, the profound change is more in my head and my heart than in my on my physical appearance and so um that's why i'm here right now in this gym um, you know, leaving my job in comfortable pay to come do something that I have had like more joy in four days than I did in, in the last seven years of, of working in a corporate job. So it's the, the profound impacts on my mental and physical state have been far outweighed the physical. So I just have a couple questions to finish up and then we'll, we'll let you get back to, to owning a gym now. Um, so do you, do you drink today? I drink for taste and not for quantity. I will say conservatively, I, or even liberally, what I would say I drink maybe three or four drinks a month at most. 
um, a month. So that was like a, a warm up for one afternoon in my last life. Um, so I do, but uh, it's at very small quantities. And, uh, and uh, there's times where I'll go a month, two months without drinking. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, but yeah, I do a little bit. Yeah. And so at, in, the, in the documentary, the, the um, person doing it asks you what your future looks like. And there's a very emotional moment where you say that your future is getting married. Mm -hmm. And so that happened. Now that's in the past. So how is that going? It's going great. We, um, we've survived COVID so far. So that's uh, a big, a big hurdle in your first year of marriage. And, uh, it's actually been fantastic because we, my wife, since that was filmed has started doing CrossFit. Um, and she was tagging along when I did my podcast at HQ and, um, very much like, "Mm, I'm good. I'll stick to 24 hour fitness. And so, in that time we've, we've, she's taken that up. And so we built out a garage gym through COVID. Um, and we worked out together every day. And so like, we really bonded physically, emotionally in that time, like we, we turned a, a potential negative into a positive and, and we, uh, so we, it was fantastic to be at home together and, um, yeah, we're, we're super happy. And she's now an integral part of, of this and, and helping me, keep myself on the rails and, um, and helping with things at the gym. And, and, and so, yeah, our marriage is fantastic. And then this will be my final question. And that is you've been through all of this. You're now a coach. Any advice you would give someone that is, lo- is like what you used to be or a coach trying to reach out to somebody like you used to be? to help them um, get over that, that hump? That's tough. It is very difficult. Um, listen, right? Listening is so critical. As much as we can help people with what their, their movements are, I think being a coach comes with being a psychologist too, right? And so having an ear for listening, being able to remember things that are important to people, being able to recount those things back to them and ask them how they're progressing through those, like that, that means so much to people that having a level of care and empathy is probably as much or more important than any amount of knowledge you're going to have about being able to teach someone how to do an air squat, um, right? And so I think that showing that you care and continuing to impress that upon the person that you're trying to reach um, is, is pivotal. And for anyone who wants to do it or is thinking about doing it, do it because you will not regret it. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Well, Justin, thank you so much for taking time out uh, to be with us today. We loved your story. It was awesome that you, you uh, got to fill in some of the gaps uh, as to what happened in that documentary. And, uh, we, and good luck with Invictus and, and everything in the future. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it was great to meet you, you too, Kat. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and, and uh, I wish you guys the best with this new podcast. I'm excited Thanks. to see what else comes from this. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll catch you later, Justin. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a great day.